Oh, yes, I'm excited for today. Why are you late this time? Oh, mate. I, look, I didn't really want to talk about it, if I'm honest with you, but I think I might be addicted to soap. What? Yeah, but the good news is I'm clean now. All right, cool. Anyways, we've got a solved mystery today. Yes, we Shit. do. Today, Ooh. we have the Moors murders. She would pick bone and hair up off the floor and not have a problem. The precise details of how Myra Hindley fulfilled Brady's fantasies remained unknown for 20 years after they were jailed for life. She certainly was the pupil. She became as bad as the master. I don't think she ever became worse than Brady because the bottom line is that the actual killing was carried out by him. But she allowed the killing to happen. She created the killing and she gloried in it. Once, when she was being picked on, he locked her out onto the street and told her to beat the bully or face a thrashing herself. A series of murders connect, committed between 1963 and 1965 by Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. This one is as famous as it gets. Mate, I'm telling you, this is from your ends, by the way. Yeah, this, this is, is from, up in Manchester, right? Up in right? Manchester. This is where it's what we're known for. It's what you went home for. It's what we're known oh, for. Oh, it's what you're known for. Sorry, accents and that. So I would say when I think of Manchester, I think of Manchester United, and then I think of. The Moors murders. Right? Those are the first two things that pop into my Thank head. Thank you, mate. And then I also think that Triple Crimes was actually born there, and that's where he spent most of the time with his uncle. That we will not speak of. Right. Talk to me, Chip. Okay. Uh, what is all this wassa wassa about? <laughs> I'm not sure what wassa wassa fully means. We might have to be careful with that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Could be some mad shit. Well, like I said, Cal, this is a huge one. These two have been called two of the most sadistic killers. And Myra Hindley has been dubbed the most evil woman in Britain. Wow, what a title. Yeah, what a title. title. You were dubbed the most handsome man in Britain and she's got the most evil woman in Britain. Hey, we can't all, uh, can't all be winning. Wait, what do I get? The most, the, the latest man in Britain. That's what you get, the latest, the latest man. man. Yeah, as in you're always late. The least punctual man in Britain. Okay. Okay, I like that one actually. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Okay, thanks for that, Chip. That was insightful. The Moore's murders. They were committed by two people, a couple in fact, Chip. Yep. Who go by the name Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Now, of course, when it comes to come to these sort of cases, these really dark ones, especially, you know, there were five murders committed in this particular case. Five that we're aware of anyways. You never know. There could be more, but all we know of is five murders and it was all committed on people under the age, kids under the age of 18. Not what you want to hear. Which is tragic, which is Not horrible. Not what you want to hear, especially Obviously, on a Monday morning. It, it, that's the last thing you want to hear on a Monday morning, but unfortunately it's our job to report these cases to you guys. And you guys have asked for the Moore's murders and that's exactly what we're doing. So it's important, Chip, that we always go ahead and take a little look at the background of the people that committed these horrible, horrible crimes. So first up, let's take a look at the background of Ian Brady. Ian Brady, born in Glasgow, 1938, under the name Ian Duncan Stewart. Now the identity of his father, not known. So we've got single mother, um, and she actually had to give Ian away to the Sloan family because she's struggling to take care of him. That's got to be tough. That is Even, tough. Like, that's tough for a mother to be forced to give away your kid. But not only that, you got to think about, you know, Ian. He, he, he now goes by the name because he went to the Sloan family. So he, he, he then went under the name Ian Sloan. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's going to be tough for any kid. Uh, regardless. And he actually ended up going to a pretty good school. The name of the school was actually Shawlands Academy. And it was known as a school that was for people that were of slightly above average intelligence. So mm -hmm. he wasn't necessarily, you know, he wasn't a stupid kid by any means, but he was a bit of a troublemaker. He got into quite a lot of trouble, especially in his early teens. Um, he actually got dumb for like breaking into a house. Um, quite a few sort of like small things. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, uh, he wasn't a model kid. He wasn't a good kid. 
uh, when he was younger. Uh, and you know, a lot of this stuff, especially you'll find when you look at a lot of these murders that end up happening, especially a lot of these tragic cases, you look back at their childhood and a lot of the time you'll find that they might have had a missing parent, particularly mm -hmm. a father. Not only that, but their childhoods just always seem to be quite rough yeah. and turbulent. And it's quite clear in Ian Brady's case, um, or Ian Sloan at the time when he was a, when he was a kid, the, that was definitely the case. Yes. After breaking into a house about nine months later, he actually ended up threatening his girlfriend at the time, Evelyn, with a flick knife Ooh. because she went to a dance with another boy. So a bit of teenage drama, but certainly no no grounds for whipping out a flick knife on someone. Um, and he actually ended up going to court and he had nine charges against him, right? Um, and he ended up getting probation. Obviously he was young at the time. He ended up getting probation, but under one condition. And that was that he went and lived with his mother. Now his mother moved to Manchester, right? And so he was now living in Manchester. His mother had married an Irish man named Patrick Brady. And he actually gave Ian his surname um, and that's how he got the so name, So he took, you know? took his stepdad's so surname, name, and so that's how he got the famous name, Ian, Ian Brady. Brady. Ian actually spends a bit of time in prison, about three months in prison, and he comes out, obviously, in Manchester, and he ends up taking a clerical job at a place called Millwards. Now, this is important because this is where he meets his partner in crime, Myra Hindley. Born in Crumpsall in 1942, raised in Gorton, Manchester. Your sides, Chip. This is, she, was, she was raised in your... This is it. I know these places. Anyway, do you actually know where Gorton is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Crumpsall. Wait, actually? Yeah, 100%. How, how far away are they from your gaff? Probably about 40 minutes. Okay. Yeah, I'll go there in a little motor. Whip about. Yeah? What's up, Myra? She's dead now, but... She's dead now, but... Yeah. Anyways, anyway, go she, ahead. like we said earlier, she has also had... An extremely rough childhood. She's had, she's got the alcoholic father who used to beat her often as a physically, child. Yeah, physically. Yeah, physically. So obviously, like you mentioned earlier, childhood trauma normally, you know, that's where these psychopaths normally stem from. Yeah, and similar case to Ian, childhood wasn't great. I mean, imagine that, you know, your dad almost uh, rewarding physical sort of violence towards other people. There was times in her childhood where she would have altercations with other kids. She would come home and say, oh, this person did something to me. And then the dad would be like, oh, why didn't you hit her back? Why mm -hmm. didn't you beat them up? Something like that. So she would actually then go back out to find the person to then just go and beat them up. And then she was rewarded at yeah, home for doing her, that. He taught her to fight. He wanted her to be equally as strong. Look, I'm all for standing up for yourself. But that is just a bit. I think this is not the right way to go about it, especially no. if you're an alcoholic father mm -hmm. uh, who beats their own kids. Not I'm a good man. not quite sure this is Parenting 101 from Myra's dad. Um, but yeah, the, uh, that, that's where we're at with that. Uh, another uh, sort of tragic thing that actually happened to Myra was that her best friend had died when she was only 15 years old. Um, and it was something that she was relatively emotional about as well, because one of the sort of characteristics that's been said that Myra Hindley doesn't have is that she's not very emotional about things mm -hmm. at all, to be honest. But this, obviously, at the age of 15, as you would, your best friend has died. This was a very emotional sort of thing for her. A, a big part of her life was all surrounding about this um, this dead best friend. When Myra was 17, she actually got engaged, but she called the whole thing off because, you know- the Cold guy, feet. Yeah, she got cold feet. The guy that she was meant to get you know, married to apparently couldn't provide her with the life that she wanted. Damn, she was, was wanting that immature. bougie lifestyle. She, yeah, she was trying to get the lifestyle. But anyway, in January, 1961, uh -huh. she becomes infatuated with the man we know as Ian Brady. And this is where it all begins. So it kicks it's a off. spiral of pain. It, it really is. And in fact, they arrange for their very first date to... And, and, and what do we say on the podcast? Uh, the worst date you could possibly go on is to the cinema. Yeah. And guess what? They went on their first date to the cinema. And Myra and Ian should have come to us for relationship advice. They should have done it. If they would ask, where, where, where do we go on our very first date? We certainly wouldn't have told you the cinema. And who knows? Maybe if they took them you know, for a little bit of, of a mini golf back then, whatever, whatever was popping, yeah? This... Could they might not be different. murderers. Yeah. They might Could not be murderers. Yeah. Their relationship was actually really sort of dark and twisted early doors because what they would actually do is they would share books on like Nazi practices and weird things that Nazis would do. 
um, to each other. And it was all very dark and they both seemed to really enjoy it. They were both really um, engrossed in like true crime, things like that. Sort of sounds a little bit like, um, you know, the way we're really into true crime, except we don't go out and commit any of these things. They were really interested in the idea of committing the perfect crime. And another sort of slightly weird and disturbing uh, like fact or, or mm -hmm. bit of info, detail, is that Myra Hindley was so into all these Nazi things that she ended up actually following that um, Aryan look, which is, you know, bleach blonde, blonde hair. hair. She yeah. had the red lipstick on. You know, these were two people that obviously connected over like dark and twisted stuff. And it doesn't surprise me that, you know, knowing it now, looking back at the time, knowing now, it doesn't surprise me that they ended up going down the route that they did, which is just horrific. Myra Hindley was actually interested in shooting and joined like a club, but- um, Well, like a shooting club. Yeah, um, but she wasn't very good. She had pretty bad aim and a bad temper, so that really didn't work out. <laughs> imagine going to a club and be like, I, I can only imagine the, the worst possible thing uh, when you're going to like a shooting club is having a bad temper. Can you imagine if you're just there knocking around and this girl is kicking and screaming, like losing her mind and oh what, she's just got a gun in her hand yeah, as well. Yeah, she's That's, missed a shot and then she's just screaming her head off. It's just it's not ideal. Though, it's not it? ideal. You'd probably be like, yeah, I don't think you are meant to hold a gun to be perfectly honest with you. Not only that, but suppose your accuracy was bad as well. Yeah. So she certainly wouldn't be in our content. Well, and <laughs> she definitely wouldn't. She won't be on game battles. <laughs> anyway, she was unsuitable, but she did end up buying guns from other members of the club, so. So despite everyone telling her, okay, let's not do the shooting stuff, yeah, right. she was obviously just there like, right, hold on a second, right? You say that all you want, but money I'm still gonna go. Money, money talks, man, money talks. She might be absolutely trash, but when she slips out those, those shillings, <laughs> yeah. that's what it was back then, I don't know. Yeah, but I think it was. I think. I wonder how many shillings it cost to get yourself a Smith and Wesson. I, I don't know. I think it might have been pounds actually. Bang. Probably like a fiver these days. You could probably back then. You're probably good. Got to go and run to, around to boss man's and just uh, yo, get me a hang on. I'll boss. drop the, I like the, the, like the pink one behind. I'll drop there. you a half a shilling. So far, this couple right here, they're giving me serious Bonnie and Clyde vibes. I mean, they spoke about, like I said, the per committing the perfect murder. Mm -hmm. You know, doing bank robberies, all these sort of things. It's sort of like these lot were the Jay Z and Beyonce of way back when. Yeah, just without, you know, child murders. Yeah, definitely. Well, I hope not. Bye. You never know. We can't be accusing Jay-Z no, and Beyonce, no, honestly. No, yeah, okay, fine. With, I love yeah. Beyonce's music. Yeah, I love Jay-Z's music, yeah. Look, all right, they're a power couple. That's what I'm getting at yeah. here, okay? Yeah, yeah, I got, they, you, they, I got they, you, I got you. They had that vibe about them. Favorite part of the show, Chip. Let's talk a little bit about the murders that Ian Brady and Myra Hindley committed. Okay. First up, it's important to note that the way we're gonna read out these murders are in the order in which they were committed, not the order in which the bodies were found because some of these bodies were actually found later, kind of like the very first one, which is Pauline Reed. Now this murder was committed on the 12th of July, 1963. One day before my birthday. Wow. Yeah, which is pretty crazy. Just 31 years before. Yeah, but it's still one day before, Chip. Now, I was really, I'm glad you brought that bit of information because now everyone viewing is just so much more knowledgeable about the case because of that bit of information you've let them all know. About. Yep, I had to let them know. Well, now they all know my birthday and they'll all buy me a present. Well, it's about two or three weeks past your birthday, so they've got they've got a year to save up. How about you just subscribe and turn on notifications? Oh, I love that from you, Chippy. <laughs> you know what it is. Pauline Reed. So yes. She was actually the first murder, okay? Um, and she actually went to school with Myra Hindley's younger sister called Maureen, right? And Reed was going out with a fella named David Smith, who was actually questioned and cleared. But it's important to remember that name because later on, David Smith becomes a little bit more involved in the story. The way this murder was actually committed was Brady had instructed Hinley to go ahead and borrow a van and drive it. And what he would do, he was on a motorcycle. And when he would see a, a victim that he seemed suitable, yeah. what he would do is he would flash his lights and that Ooh. way, Hindley knew to then pull over and what he did was he approached Reed, who was only 16 years old at the time, and said, do you fancy a lift home? Now, personally, my, my, my mom always taught me, don't get in a car with strangers. But unfortunately, Hindley was just a little too persuasive. You know, good, it was, it was a woman, she was in a car by herself, offers up a lift, 
look, it, it doesn't seem that scary at the time, right? Um, and obviously she decides to take her up on the offer. And once she gets in the car, she says, oh, would you mind coming and help me look for an expensive glove? Such a strange Why? Why thing a to ask for. Like it could have been absolutely anything. I've lost my dog, I've lost my cat, you know, I've lost my four month old child, like, no, we're looking but, for a glove. An expensive glove. I yeah. just thought it was a little bit weird. Anyways, Myra Hindley drives Reed up to Saddleworth Moor. Okay, obviously that's where we get the name Moor Murders. Um, and what ends up happening is Brady says to the girl, right, let's go look for this expensive glove out and about out there. And unfortunately what happens is he goes and kills Reed. Out, out in the moors and what he does is he then comes back to Hindley and says do you want to come and see what I've done to her essentially he takes her over to the spot where she is and you know we try not to get too graphic here but ultimately you know her throat was just completely slit open yeah slit open it was just a horrible sight not only that but there was uh, you know reported that uh, there was sexual assault that was also uh, committed prior to her uh, being killed. So it was really, like, it was a brutal death. This isn't, like, you know, just a, a really sort of, I don't know, there's no nice way to die, but there are certainly more brutal ways, and this is, uh, this is how they did it. After the attack, Brady actually buries her in the moor, uh, and what, well, according to Brady anyways, supposedly... Uh, Hindley wasn't there for the killing, but was there for the sexual assault. Um, but there are some conflicting um, statements, statements yeah. about that. Uh, and, and, and some say that Hindley was actually just there for the full thing. So yeah, it's, it's a bit up in the air. But yeah, like I said, was buried in the moor. And this is just the first of five murders. 23rd of November, we have John Kilbride, the next victim, only 12 years old. Now this, this had a big search involved. There were 700 statements, 500 missing posters printed, and 2,000 volunteers. That's a lot of volunteers. That's a, a lot of manpower. That's a lot of volunteers. Again, it was a similar situation. They offered him a lift home. They promised him a bottle of sherry, but uh, he's 12 years old, which is a bit confusing. Anyway- Hey look, hey look, if someone offered me a drink, I, I, I probably would have taken it, you know? Oh, 100%. Well, anyway, they've told him that they need to stop off at home to get him the bottle of sherry. Right. And whilst driving, Ian Brady has suggested to John that, you know, they help look for this glove. This bloody same, glove again. Same, same story. Same thing again. So they take him out to the moors. Mm -hmm. And when they get there, Brady takes Kilbride out into the moors. Look, um, looking for this expensive glove. Yes. Uh, Myra is actually waiting in the van. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what they said before. Um, anyway, he tries to slit his throat. Uh, ends up failing, so he strangles him with a shoelace. This, remember, by the way, guys, this is a 12 year old boy. Yeah. Like, it's mental. Look. It's it's not, it can't even have been like a challenge, you know? It's just so horrific to even think about the idea of it. But what made them think as well that, oh, we can get him into the van by offering him sherry, sherry. alcohol? Like, like, that. I don't know. It just, it, it's confusing. What's to me. weird to me as well. And you know, throughout the entire thing, is why is it always kids? Do they have they? I guess like, they have must they have had some up? obsession, obviously, with a child as well. It's very easy to overpower. To it's convince. very easy to trick. You know, yeah. if I came up to twenty-one-year-old Cal Freezy in the street and I said, "Yo, chief, like, get in my van. I got a bottle of sherry for you." You know what? Maybe you would get. Yeah, for the bottle <laughs> of sherry, maybe. But uh, for, for, I know what you're like. Yeah, for offering me a lift home. No, nah, thanks. I'll just get yeah, an Uber. Like, but I get what you mean. Like when it's with children, it's. Very, very easy to yeah, convince very them. Very naive. Very easy to overpower them. But it just, I don't know. I just, it, it, are those really the reasons why they did it? Anyways, 16th of June, 1964. Again, what you, what I kind of notice about these murders, uh, by the way, is that they all seem to be like a six month yeah. difference in it. Is, is it like a cooling off period? Yeah, like or, a little break, like, you know. They could just be waiting for like the investigation to completely die out, let a bit of the interest cool off because maybe if they were too close, it would just be like, it would cause too much of a, a stir. So the six months difference makes it seem like it might not always be the same person. Cause ultimately like these kids are going missing. The police are not finding these bodies to attach like a death to it, right? Yeah. So if so they, they were finding know. these bodies, they might be like, oh, there's a serial killer on this, but they're not, they're just missing, right? Yeah. The kids are just going missing. So this six month cooling period is 
kind of interesting that that's the time frame they've decided to do it in. But anyways, like I said, 16th of June, 1964, a kid called Keith Bennett. Now, in this particular case, it was actually his stepfather, Jimmy Johnson, who was their main suspect. The police were like, yo, this guy is looking like he might be the guy. And they actually brought him in four times. Oof. But as we know now, it wasn't the stepfather. It was, in fact, of course, Ian and Myra. Okay? Now... How did they do this particular murder? Well, it's not actually that much different from the previous ones. Again, in this particular murder, it, 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 they all seem to be following this same story, the same path. This particular time, obviously, Keith, Keith Bennett, he's only 12 years old. Mm. He's, uh, he's been asked by Myra Hindley, again, who seems to be the one sort of enticing everyone she's obviously it's a woman you would trust a woman friendly, a little bit more. friendly yeah. face yeah yeah and uh you know i'm not too sure if it was ian brady maybe these kids would be like whoa stranger danger yeah. but with a woman you're probably more likely to to help out and she says to keith bennett hey i'll give you a lift home obviously it's the same story again chip they've they've pulled out the bloody lost glove once again and they say come help me look for it in the moor they've gone out to the moor and of course Ian Brady has gone and killed and sexually assaulted that poor kid, Keith Bennett, again. Boxing Day, 1964. So not not a great not a great Christmas here. Mate, mate this is not what you want during no, Christmas time. No, Leslie Ann Downing. She disappeared from a fun fair in Ancoats. Now, there was a massive search afterwards, of course. They found nothing. Now, it's a little bit different to the previous murders, the way they've mm -hmm. done it. They have approached her. Um, she's 10 years old, by the way, this one. 10 yeah. years old they've approached her and deliberately dropped a bunch of shopping like near her and said Yo, can you help us take it to the car uh, obviously she's done so and then they took her to a house where they forced her to pose naked for pictures grim yeah so grim and can i just say this is a fun fair like how how twisted and sick do you need to be to go to a fun fair to deliberately trick yeah. a 10 year old kid. Well, it's an easy place to obviously pick up a child. Obviously. Anyway, after they've made a post of those pictures, she has been sexually assaulted and murdered. But it's different because she's been murdered at the house this time. Right, okay. So the next day they've taken her out to the moors and they've buried her there. So same place, obviously, yeah. they think that's a great spot for hiding the bodies. Yeah, what's, what's interesting, or I, 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 maybe not interesting, but what's different about this is they actually have audio recordings, right? There are 16 minutes long of this poor girl literally pleading for her life. And they've kept this audio recording. They've kept the photos. It's all just that so is, twisted. Yeah, that's like, not great. Why? Like one thing is committing that, but they actually wanted to keep record of this now. They wanted to hold on to the memories of what they did to this girl. Like. This it's, isn't like this. It, it's just, gets just more, so sick. Yeah, it's it gets so more sick, sick and it? twisted as the story goes yeah. on. According to Hindley, and this is like when we said earlier, conflicting statements. She said she went to go make a bath, and she came back, and Downey was dead. Okay, but now according to Brady, Hindley was the one that actually killed Downey. So like now they they've gone from being that power couple, you to, know, to yeah. pinning it on each other. Yeah, it's, it's not gone well. No, not at all. And it's just like I mean ultimately it doesn't matter you knew what was happening you knew what was you going to happen yeah. you knew you you're both as bad as each other yeah. it's grim i guess they're just trying to shave like a couple of years off the sentence Try, it doesn't they're, make they're a difference just, you lot are done yeah interestingly enough maureen you know hindley's sister actually married david smith later down the line remember, remember remember that book i told you to remember yeah. him he was dating the first victim yeah. pauline reed yes Bang. now i I would imagine that David Smith didn't know that Ian Brady and Myra Hindley killed his girlfriend at the time. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I, I imagine no, that was the case. Assume so. But it is interesting to note that a lot of people have said that David Smith and Ian Brady got on like a house on fire. They sh shared a lot of values in terms of like wealth distribution, their thoughts on crime, stuff like that. Like they got along really well. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of people out there that actually reckon David Smith had a lot to do with the murders than people originally let on. But yeah, it's just safe to say that they got on really well. And in fact, David Smith ends up being involved in one of the murders we're gonna talk about. 6th of October, 
1965. Unfortunately, we've got another victim chip, and this time his name is Edward Evans. Now, the way this one played out is actually very different. Uh -huh. uh, you know, the, the, the glove w wasn't present in this particular story, okay? Thank God. So we've got something different. This time, Hinley drove Ian Brady to the, um, I believe it was called like Manchester Central Railway Station. Uh, and he went in there while she waited in the car. He went out there to select the victim. And what he did was he approached Evans and sort of invited him for a sexual encounter back at the home. So what they did was they jumped in the car with uh, Myra Hindley. They went back to the house and they had a little glass of wine. Now, what happened was at this point, she had been told to contact David Smith and say, yo, come round. And when you come round, wait for a signal to enter the house. And once you see that signal, you can come in. So what he did was he waited for the signal. He saw the signal, which was a flash of the light again. He comes into the house and what does he see? He goes into the bedroom and he sees Ian Brady with a hatchet standing over, legs over, and whacking Edwards in the face with one of these hatchets. Now, it said that David Smith had nothing to do with it, he just saw it. And what happened after that was it was supposedly an electrical cord strangled the strangled Ed, uh, Evans. And from there he was wrapped in some plastic sheet and then put in the spare bedroom. Now, like I said, I'm not really, so I'm a little bit confused about this for a couple things. One, if David went in and didn't do anything like is supposedly claimed, what was the point in him being there, right? That, Except all he did yeah. was help move the body into the spare bedroom. Maybe, That's all that maybe happened. they're trying to, so you, we spoke about how they become such good friends earlier on. Yeah. Maybe they were thinking, let's turn this double, let's turn this double X into a triple X. You know, we've got three yeah. people involved. They can commit more murders, whatever. Maybe they were thinking he's a good friend. They wanted to get him involved. Yeah, but but only supposedly. Why according else would you to this, show him? All, the, the only thing is that he, he comes in, he just helps move the body, but he's there and he witnesses the whole thing. But why? Like, I just don't see the benefit yes. other than him being a good mate of Ian Brady's. Just, What's the point? And even still, for him, for him himself, like he comes in, he's been told to wait for a signal. He's probably thinking, like, okay. What's he going walks on in the door and he just sees his friends. Surely he'd go, oh my something. God, what are you doing? Or oh, is stop, he yeah. twisted as well? Yeah. And he goes, yeah, I'm, I, I knew you were going to invite me to one of these. Have they corrupted, have they corrupted his him? mind? Yeah. The involvement of David Smith was ultimately... The downfall, the end, yeah. finally. The re they, they brought in David Smith to almost flex on him or just yep. show that they the, that they can just do this to people for fun, right? And finally, it's the they, reason they brought the world they down got caught. Them. Anyway, so David Smith, he comes back the following day with a pram, and this is to transport Evan's body uh, to a car so they can take it to Saddleworth Moors. Any, I so, wonder why, why did why did they always want to bury them all in the well, same place? Well, the Saddleworth place? Moors, you know, I've been there. This place, yeah. it's a, it's an open place. It's you know, is it, it's a, is it haunted? As it's all? wild plains. I mean, it could be haunted now. So you know, awful things have happened there. And what's it like? Like, describe the place to me. It's it's a pretty pretty scary place to drive through at night. It's, is it big? Is it just like loads of? It's big open plains. You know, oh, okay. it's a great it's a great place to bury a body. Obviously. Okay. Anyway, uh, he goes home at three a.m. and he actually throws up. Uh, he tells his wife everything that happens, and it's he's sick. not built for it. Like he's those not other built two. for it. You know, this isn't him. Yeah. You know, he's, I think he's seen this stuff and he's gone. I actually can't hack this. He's almost yep. had what do you call it? Like an epiphany? Not an epiphany, but just one of those moments where he's gone. This is actually so tapped. Well, I mean, you'd th you think he would have said that when he saw Ian with a hatchet, but either it took, way. It took until the next day. Yeah, anyway, so at 10 past six in the morning, three hours later, he yeah. calls up the police from a telephone box. He actually took a screwdriver with him just That's for protection. Pre yeah, just so for this man was clearly shaken up yeah, by he's everything scared. he'd seen. He's obviously seen all that and he's thinking, oh, I yeah. could be in trouble. Anyway, the police pick him up and they take him to Hyde Police Station. The police actually decided to take some action. Okay, so good stuff. Yeah, so immediate turned, action. We oh, love to 100%. see it. Hundred percent. They've turned up to the couple's house and they've actually dressed up as a bread delivery man. So you okay, know, they're going up the cover. All right, I'll read that. Yeah, uh, they've turned up. They've asked Myra if her husband is home. They've invited. They've been invited into the house, and Ian Brady is sat there, and he's actually writing a letter to his employer about an ankle injury. Now you're wondering well, why have you put that little detail in there? Well, because. 
according to David Smith, he had actually rolled his ankle while he was killing Evans. So, you know, only a couple of days later, he was there like, yo, I need the time off work. I've done my ankle in. You know, complete, maybe he's thinking- Complete cat. Super, well, no, he did do his ankle in, but oh, yeah, it, that's it, true. It, it wasn't five aside or anything. No, no, no. It, it was it, it was him killing someone. Yeah, no. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting that that little detail was left in there. The police actually told the couple that they were investigating uh, an issue the previous night involving some guns. Uh, gun violence. Yeah, gun violence. Hinley's told the police that they know uh, nothing of it. Um, they've let the police view the house, go looking over everywhere. Take a look at the crib. Nothing yeah. has happened here. Welcome, MTV Cribs, you know, Myron. Yeah, yeah welcome to my crib. <laughs> anyway, there was one thing though. Uh, a locked spare bedroom, like you mentioned before, because that's where they put the body. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Myra's told the police that uh, she's left the key at work. Now, the police have offered to take... Uh, okay, then ju jump in the way. Yeah, the police, let's go the get police the have said, let's go get that. But anyway, Ian says, you know, hand over the key. Yeah. He's just kind of, you know... I wonder why he's done that. He's just uh, he's coughed up the key pretty easily. Obviously, you know, the police have gone into the room, seen everything, and... Uh, 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 Ian Brady, mate, uh, you've got a, a dead body in here. Yeah, anyway, so they've taken Ian... They arrested uh, him. Yeah, they've gone downstairs and arrested Ian for the suspicion of murder. But Actually, Chip, mm -hmm. Myra Hindley was arrested shortly after, but she was charged with the accessory to murder. Better than nothing. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, exactly. And what was even better was the fact that when they searched the house, they found a book that belonged to Kilbride. Remember that young lad that mm -hmm. was killed earlier? They actually found a book that belonged to him. And that obviously was massive for the police because it made them realize, hold on a second. It's not just the one that's being killed. We have got uh, at least one more victim yep. in this whole case. So it, it opened up the can of worms. Ian Brady and Myra Hindley wanted to get rid of all the incriminating evidence Possible. So what they did was they packed it all into a suitcase, yeah. closed the suitcase up, and they actually managed to put it in the left luggage eh. in in Manchester railway station. It's such a weird place it to is, put incriminating evidence. Like why don't why don't you just burn it, man? But supposedly, right? And supposedly, uh, Ian Brady just had a thing for railway stations. Like he just liked railway stations. I know that sounds silly, right? No, no, but he's a train it, man. And because the police knew that, they decided, right, well, let's go see if we can find any of this evidence. So they actually went to Manchester uh, Station, and that's where they found this suitcase in the left luggage. Mm -hmm. Now, in this suitcase was like a gold mine of evidence. It had photographs, notes, costumes, you know, and, and these photographs were very graphic, you know, horrible photographs of, of all the stuff. And that's where they also found the audio tape of that girl crying. Um, they had the gun that was found in there as well. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, it was just pretty grim. Mate. I couldn't imagine opening yeah. up a suitcase. So this like suitcase alone has tied, you know, Ian Brady and Myra Henley to yeah. the other murders. Yeah. So yeah, well, what was interesting actually is that Ian Brady, when he was confronted and the police said, look at these photos we found. He said, yes, I did take those photos. But after I took those photos, uh, Downey, the girl, um, was taken away by two men. Cap. So had had no idea what happened to her. And he's obviously given super cap here. Yeah, mega sir, cap. Yeah, sir cap a lot. Yes, yeah, so absolutely sir yeah. cap a lot because we know that is not the case. Second of December, mm -hmm. we have great news. Ian Brady was charged with the murders of Kilbride, Downey and Evans. And Myra Hindley has been charged with the murders of Downey and Evans. And then as an accessory- You got there. I got there uh, to the murder of Kilbride. Fantastic news. An interesting thing about the photos was that it actually had Hindley's dog in the background of some of them. And weirdly enough, what that meant was by looking at the dog and seeing like its age, they were actually able to put a timeline of when these all happened. So they could look at the dog and be like, right, this is this happened then. It looks slightly older here. And so they managed to create an entire timeline. I like timeline. that, you know, for like the 60s to the 80s. Whatever. Mate, that, that is so that's, smart. That's good detective work. That, that's I'm, good stuff. You get, you get the, the thumbs up from the fellas. Seal of, seal of approval from the fellas. I'm not going to lie, Chip. We often like to get onto the police and the poor jobs that they do. But they've actually done all right yeah. with this one anyways. Yeah, but and they're on time. It's not all happy, happy stories, okay, Chip? Because, unfortunately this dog was set to be examined and they put it under anesthetic 
and unfortunately, the dog didn't make it, lad. The dog didn't make it. How that's, sad that's, is that? That's, that's, uh, we were just talking about how great the police work has been. And, uh, the, the well, we'll blame this one on the vets. We'll blame this one on the vets. I don't know. Anyway, okay. Unfortunately, the dog didn't make it out um, alive. And uh, according uh, to sources, uh, Myra Hindley was absolutely fuming about that. And it also it plays into the fact that she, the only other time that she'd really shown a lot of emotion was when her best friend Died. remember when she like, was when she was in her childhood yes. so they, they say that she lacks a lot of emotion but she was obviously very attached to that dog she was very attached to her best friend and when both of those had died they'd obviously shown yeah, a lot of emotion but she wasn't so. showing any emotion when they killed children which yeah is just a bit twisted yeah batshit crazy trial now this began on april 19th 1966 and it only lasted 14 days uh david smith was obviously the prosecution prosecution's main witness now there was a question around whether his uh, testimony was affected by like financial incentives because he was offered he sold his story to newspapers yeah and he got more money if oh, they so were convicted like if they were convicted he got a bigger sum of money oh uh, but, so you yeah. so the, the the case was like, oh, is he gonna? Is he only trying to get these guys convicted because he's got quite a bit of money riding on it? Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah, but in the end, the attorney general has said he wasn't motivated by that. Right, Everything's cool to go ahead. All right. Brady was found guilty on all murder counts, um, while Hindley has been acquitted in the case of John Kilbride, but was found guilty uh, to be an accessory to John's murder, as well okay. as guilty of the murders of. Downey and Edwards. All right, so she got done for two of them, an accessory yeah. for one. Everything's whereas... coming together. We're getting them charges slapped down. You love to see it. The cuffs are on. You're going down. They got life sentences, Chip. Fantastic. Great news. Although, the death penalty was on the cards, but around that time, it was a time where they had sort of abolished and got rid of the, of the death penalty, which Maybe some viewers think is a good thing. Some people might say they deserved it. Either way, they got life sentences here. Ian Brady, right? It takes a certain man to do this, right? But he actually asked to live in solitary confinement Ooh. and he did so for 19 years. Do you think that's because he knew other prisoners were gonna, you know, possibly- Fuck him up? Yeah, absolutely better him. I mean, he murdered kids, yeah, maybe, but Assuming I this was a know. famous it case. takes a series like it takes something else to ask to live in solitary it's like confinement living in a dark as, hole almost yeah it's for awful. 19 years which is just i could never imagine that but anyways um after those 19 years he ended up being diagnosed with being a psychopath they said look hey are you, you are a psychopath i mean look, I, surprised? i'm surprised it took 19 years yeah. that's what i will say i'm surprised it took that long um and yeah, he was ended up getting sent to a high security prison after that. In the 1980s, this is quite some time after they committed the murders, news broke that they were actually responsible for five victims and not just the original three. Uh, these two more victims that they've added on were Pauline Reed and Bennett. So, so far they'd just been charged with the, with the three murders, but we'd obviously run you guys through five different murders. So finally it did come like, 10, 10 or so years later, mm -hmm. right? But they finally said, actually, you guys did these yeah, two Yeah, so as they well. finally got them nailed down for five. And even on later on in the investigations, Hindley, Myra Hindley actually refused to admit that she was just involved in the killings yeah, at two. all. But she did help the police and take them to like the Saddle of Wars and help with photos and stuff like that. Oh, what, to help them try and find the bodies? Mm -hmm. Okay. Eventually in 1987, guess what? Hindley fesses up. She confessed that she'd done all five murders. I mean, the years had passed. It was it was on her mind. She's confessed, I done five. Now, what they did was the police then went to Ian Brady and said, look, Hindley has confessed to all five. Okay. And what Ian Brady said was, if you can prove to me that she actually did confess to all five, I'll confess as well. Ooh. Interestingly enough, they did manage to prove it but he was only gonna confess under one condition, right? And that was that he would be allowed to commit suicide immediately after confessing. Not no chance. Happen. No, not no happen. chance. I've never even heard of that. You're not getting off that lightly. Yeah, like who, I've never heard of that being asked for when like, Mate, the guy, like we said, this guy was a psychopath. He had a lot of things wrong with him. Yeah. But he obviously wanted the easy way out here. Oh, 100%. You no. know, he couldn't deal with what he'd done. Yeah. 
1st of July, we've made a breakthrough. The police have found Reed's body 100 yards away from where they found Downey's body. So they're, they're finding the victims, finally. Mm -hmm. um, they've, once Ian Brady's actually found out about this, he makes a formal confession. So obviously now, Better late than ever. yeah, now he knows like they found the bodies, you know, I'm fucked. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> he even offers to help the police. Maybe he's trying to get some years of his sentence. He goes to Saddleworth, uh, Saddleworth Moors with the police and he tries to point out the area of where Bennett's body is. Uh, right. The police have obviously dug that up. But unfortunately, Bennett's body couldn't be found. And to this day, Bennett's body still has not been found. Do you I think mean, that's because he's pointed out the wrong areas? No, do you know what? It, it has been why. 20 years later. Yeah. And I think it would be a bit pointless maybe to point it out. Maybe, I, I know this might sound weird, right? But the guy has been locked up for 20 odd years, okay? This might sound like, do you reckon, he, maybe just, do you reckon well. he just wanted to go outside? I'm not even joking when I say that. I swear to you, bro. Did it's, he just want to go out and just revisit the, the the site? It's possible. He probably doesn't know. even remember. It's such a vast place. Like it's going to be pretty. I was going to say my next thing to you would be, I've never been to this place, but is it one of those ones where like why haven't the police just dug up the whole place? And yeah, it's just it? an entire moors. Like is it's it huge? Just, it's not. It's not an option really. really? Yeah. It's too expensive. Yeah, but yeah, unfortunately, Bennett's body still not found. Mm. And Bennett's mother was still visiting Saddleworth Moors um, up until about August 2012 when she died. She you know, obviously Bennett was still buried there. I guess she, she would just, just go there. there. Kind of like when you visit a grave, yeah. almost. That must, that must be really tough, I'm not yeah. gonna lie. Like, could you imagine going there just almost almost knowing that he's there somewhere? You just don't, you just don't know where. where. That's quite That's horrible. pretty sad. Uh, and further updates from there is Hinley died on the 15th of November, 2002 due to pneumonia. Yep. Uh, and her partner in crime, Ian Brady died on the 15th of May, 2017. So a bit more recently. Uh, but yeah, that's where we're at with, uh, with this case. Look. It's gonna be a struggle for them to find Bennett's body, in my opinion. I hope, I hope one day they, they do, but you know, the, the mom's dead now. I don't yeah. know, is there much family good, there? Yeah, it'd be good for maybe the remaining family members. What do you think, Chip? I've got a question for you. Who do you think was in charge here? Like, because obviously they were a bit of a power couple here. Do you reckon it was more so Ian Brady going to Myra Hindley, come on, let's do this, it's you and me. Or do you think it was Myra Hindley sort of coercing her her partner Ian into doing all this stuff. I'd who say, was who was who was the power? With, who was the alpha here? With the details that we've gone over here, I feel like Ian Brady just you know he lacks empathy, lacks emotion. He he's I think he's like a bit, he's a psychopath. Okay, he's yeah, the he crazy is. one. She's become infatuated with him. I think he, she's like in she's, love with she's him. She's started so much. to share, you know they've started to share the same ideals, the same. She shared like values. Yeah, the same values over the relationship. Like she's adopted them. Yeah. she's just become as nuts as him yeah. because when we spoke she did show emotion when her friend died uh so she's got she it in younger. her when her dog died she's got it in her i think ian brady has twisted her mind into really? this yeah i i, I crazy think place if she did say early doors like in the relationship like when she met ian brady it was like it was very much like an infatuation she loved everything about him and she said that he could have like convinced her of absolutely anything and she would have believed it. Yeah. Like she even said, if she had told, told him the earth was flat, you know, that he, she it, would have believed it. it. it so- It isn't. It, uh, that, uh, Chip, please. Another mystery for another, another day. Mystery. Anyways, look, I, I agree with you. I think, it, yeah. I think Ian Brady was the, uh, definitely the, the, maybe the leader of the two, but please don't get it twisted. They are both horrific yeah. people. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this particular uh, episode on yeah. the Moore's murder. If you guys did, then what do they have to do, Chip? You have to subscribe and hit that little bell to turn on notifications so you won't miss an episode of the Fellas Mysteries. They're out every Monday at 6 p.m. This has been myself, PC Crimes, and Detective Freezy. Oh, your little knees slapped. He's <laughs> okay. got nice thighs. Uh, and we will see you on the on next the episode. Sorry, I robbed your line. Nah, it's all right, it's all right. It's We're all giving right. them a gunshot. Okay. Yeah, half a shilling. Oh, you know what? They should bring back the shilling. It just sounds cool. Half a shilling, please, boss. It was an aside. Half a pound. <laughs> a pound's your shit. Shill me up, boss. Shit, yeah. <laughs> Lend me a shill. Lend me a shilling. Oh, I'm starving. I'm so hungry. They kept track of how many times he said not only that. How many was that? Only three. Oh, that's okay. That's, that's not bad. That's good.